Last week, I broke my fast, and um, I had fasted July and August, uh, no internet, no TV for two months. And guess what? I survived. <laughs> I mean, it was a little touch and go for a little while. And, um, but so I took the month of July, um, and um, I did uh, what's called shred, which is you read the Bible and, um, in 30 days. And so I wanted to add something extra for August. So I uh, read the book of Proverbs and the book of James 25 times in the month of August. And so then I uh, broke my, uh, my fast uh, last week, um, turned on the news feed of my phone, and guess what I found out? Nothing's changed. <laughs> Except I did hear like um, that the pandemic was coming back, or, and I was like, I, I am not wearing a mask, okay? <laughs> okay, like you could beat me down, but I am not putting that thing on my face again, right? Now, also, too, like, uh, I am taking, you know, like, um, extra supplements for my immunity, and I will not stand next to uh, someone uh, that's coughing or sneezing, okay? Um, but there are, there are tons of other epidemics and pandemics that have been going on for years. And so, uh, when you look at it and you go, okay, um... What are some of these other epidemics that have just been going on forever? And, and it's so easy uh, to see them because whole industries have be cre been created by uh, the cause of these. And I mean, there's, there's whole industries. There's a bankruptcy attorney industry. It's a whole industry. There's, there's another industry, a uh, divorce attorney and uh, and I know so just so so you know I know that there are there are often extra stential circumstances that get involved in in uh, uh, in those kind of things and there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus okay but I will tell you that we could probably solve ninety percent of every divorce if every uh, if every man read Ephesians 5, verse 25, at least one time a week. And it says, husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church, who gave himself up for her. And the question we have to ask is, what did Christ do for the church? He died for the church. So as husbands, we have to literally um, have the mindset that I will die for my spouse. Someone came up to me after service and said, hey, you know what? You should say that we not only need to be able to die for our spouse, but we need to have the ability to swim through a, uh, a shark-infested water uh, to give our wife a glass of lemonade. <laughs> and so um, our company, is a, we're, a, we're a general contractor, and so uh, I'm, I'm a uh, part-time pastor. Um, and so uh, I'm kind of uh, on, uh, I'm on staff, but under the category of junior pastor. And so um, um, as a business, we're, uh, we're contractors. And what we, uh, what we do is we remodel and renovate apartment buildings. And one of our biggest books of business, one of the biggest things we do as a company, I'd say it's about 20 to 30% of our, our, our job pipelines is um, this business and it's called construction defect. And so what our company gets to do is when buildings are built and, and their corners have been cut, um, the buildings oftentimes have to be torn apart and put back together. And so, you know, I was uh, meeting with um, uh, one of the developers that uh, had built this building. And before it was even occupied, we were tearing it apart. And I asked him, I said, what, why? Why did you guys um, cut so many corners? And he said, well, we cut mostly the corners of waterproofing, and it's because you can't see it. I mean, you can't see it. 
It's underneath it. And this building was so beautiful on the outside. So beautiful. I mean, it was so sleek and so modern and contemporary. And the amenities on this property were spectacular. I looked at it and I was like, man, I just, I need to go do some remodeling at my house. Right? But they had cut these corners on the inside of the water, on the waterproofing. They had cut these corners. And because they cut these corners, that was about $2,000 per unit. That's what the waterproofing that they cut out of their budget. Because they cut that out of the budget and they cut that corner, it cost them $50,000 a unit to put it back together. So it's this whole business of construction defect, and it's caused by this cause um, is the cause of so many uh, horrific uh, areas of our culture, and it's character deficiency. It's the cause of almost every company that blows up, and we see it. We see it in all industries of life, right? We see it. Uh, you know, like when I turned on my news feed, I was like, oh my goodness. The, you know, the, uh, the probably uh, the best young pitcher that the Dodgers have, his, he's not even part of the team anymore. And it's not just that he wasn't part of the team. Like they literally removed his locker from the locker room. They covered up every picture of him from the stadium. And why? Because he had a because he had a character defect. He had a deficiency in his character, and it doesn't matter how talented you are. You know, talent is God-given. Character has to be built. And if you have the choice of both, if you have the choice of one, pick character. Pick character. We're talking about character today, building our character building our character. Because church, it's a core value of our church. It's a core value of our mission statement to become more like Jesus. But even more than it's a core value of our church, it's a core value of being a follower of Jesus. And so, uh, hey, we had our, our marketplace uh, this last Friday night. Well, raise your hand if you were there. It was so good. It was so good. We had 200 people, and I, I just want to let you know, if you want to be part, or you have, uh, you know, if you uh, are in the marketplace, which means that you work vocationally outside of the church, and you want to be part of our group, we are your people, okay? So um, we, you could go online to sign up. We're going to a, um, we're going as a church to do a uh, a field trip in October, and it's to uh, Palm Springs to an amazing conference, the Bob Harrison Increase Conference, and we have like uh, half-price signups, and the uh, hotels are half-price. It's a great, great venue, and it's a great, um, it's just, it's a great conference where there's a spirit there of increase and creative ideas, and you will go there and be refreshed. And also, the last two or three years, our church has brought the most amount of people. Okay, so I got, we got to keep our streak. Yeah, so we'd love, we'd love to have, uh, have you. And uh, I was sharing uh, in the first service, somebody, people had asked me, they had said, hey, um, you know, when you took the, that 60 days off, what, um, what did, you know, like everyone was wondering, like, did some soup thing happen supernatural, right? And I'm like, you know, I'm just not really that way. I can't really figure things out, right? So I'm like, you know, I don't know uh, what happened. I, I will tell you this, um, afterwards, um, after 60 days of uh, just like focusing on like getting as much scripture as I could inside me, and um, I had a way, I've had a way deeper compassion for people way deeper compassion for people. And then after reading the book of Proverbs uh, 25 times in one month, um, I've been very careful about what I say. Because the scripture says, even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent. So uh, I've been, uh, I just, I've been slower to speak, quicker to listen, and I'm not going to let myself become angry. So we're talking about character, and it counts, church. It counts. 
And uh, uh, before I start, I, w- I want to honor our senior pastors, Pastor Jude and Pastor Becky. Um, if you love Pastor Jude and Pastor Becky, will you give them a hand? Let- <laughs> so many things I love about them, but I-, I will say one thing is that they see the greatness inside of people. And, and, and leadership is a lot about just giving somebody else a permission slip to be great. We're talking about character. It counts. It counts. It, 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 def, it, it defines us as people. Let me, let me give you the definition of character. It's the mental and moral qualities distinct with, distinctive to an individual 1 Timothy 4.16, it says, watch your life. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 1 Timothy 4.16, it says, cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you, uh, you mature right before their eyes. And here's the power right here. Keep a firm grasp on your character. Don't be diverted. And then both those and, uh, that hear you and yourself will experience salvation. Um, so uh, um, uh, Jan and I are just coming up on our 30-year anniversary, and, uh, uh, which is amazing. Like, um, and so when we first got married... Um, you know, like uh, most of you know my story, I, I'm an ex-drug addict and an uh, uh, ex-drug dealer. And um, Jan and I got, uh, we got married and uh, then I wasn't, you know, uh, selling drugs anymore. Uh, <laughs> and so I had, a, I was repairing drywall and Janet was uh, assisting people cutting hair. Uh, we had two small kids and reality began to set in. As I, you know, like I was like, oh my goodness, I'm responsible for other humans. And uh, my my son had like this cyst over his eye and uh, kids were starting to make fun of him about his cyst over his eye. It wasn't dangerous, but we wanted to get that removed. Um, Both kids needed braces. And uh, then it came to a head, like I had a, like a super bad toothache. And so I went to the dentist and he was like, um, hey, it's going to be like uh, $1,500. Um, and this is like 30 years ago. Okay. So it's probably like 10,000 now. Like the dentist is so ridiculous. I mean, like, so um, he's like, hey, it'll be $1,500 to fix it. And I'm like, what's wrong with it? He said, it's got a crack in it. I'm like, hey, I'm a drywall repair guy. Can we just like put some fix-all in it and put some duct tape over it? We'll be fine. He's like, no, it doesn't work that way. I said, well, I don't have $1,500. Is there another option? And he's like, yeah, we can remove it um, for $300. And I'm like, does that include um, uh, like the, the Novocaine or putting me under? And because if, if you could do it without Novocaine for 200, because I didn't have the money. And then, you know, I remember before I went to the dentist, Janet was like this, and you know, Mike, we're going to need to buy a house at some point. I'm like, okay, uh, no pressure. And he's like, no, it's 300 bucks, Novocaine or no Novocaine, okay? I'm like, okay. Yank that thing out. And he's all, I just want to let you know, you're not going to be able to chew on the right side of your mouth and without that tooth. And, um, and I'm like, I, I'm sorry, I, my, my kids need braces. I'm not going to spend the kids' brace, braces money on one tooth, right? And so um, he took the tooth out and uh, turns out he was right. I couldn't chew on that side. But strangely enough, you could still be chubby and chew on one side of your mouth. <laughs> I made it work for like five or seven years, okay, until finally I, I got to get this thing fixed, okay? And so, you know, like we're just in like this financial, like, you know, like there was just more month than there was money. And, you know, so we're just in this position and, you know, like I, I've just become cr- Christian and I'm just learning how to pray and, and, I, and I had this prayer and it was like this, God send me money. Has anybody else ever prayed that? 
Okay, the rest of you are lying. (laughs) And it was one of the first times I really sensed the Holy Spirit, really sensed the Holy Spirit speak to my heart and said, you don't have a money problem. You have a wisdom problem. So I changed my prayer. God sent me wisdom. (laughs) I talked to my pastor, and um, I will say this, and I'm going to go a little... A, a little sideways for a second. Um, I've always had a, a spiritual leader in my life, someone that has spoken to my life. And uh, my first pastor, like, uh, he literally, like, fathered me. He was the first positive male role model that I had. And um, he would just uh, speak into my life, right? And, he, and I asked him, I said, you know, I, I've been praying, and I feel like the Lord said I need wisdom to run my business. And he said, you absolutely do. You should start reading the book of Proverbs, which is something I'm telling business people from all over the world to start doing. And they're like, hey, Mike, what should I do? Read the book of Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs. And so I started reading the book of Proverbs, and I, I actually hand wrote some of my favorite ones out uh, this morning for you. Uh, Proverbs 24, 3, it says, by wisdom, a house is built. A house is symbolic for our lives. So let me say it again. By wisdom, your life will be built. And through, uh, through understanding, its rooms will be filled with rare and beautiful treasure. Um, Proverbs 3.13, it's one of my favorites. It says, in the message translation, it says, you're blessed when you meet Lady Wisdom. Okay, wives, now you can tell your husband that uh, wisdom is a lady, okay? Found it in the Bible. You're blessed when you meet Lady Wisdom, when you make friends with Madame Insight, because she's, because wisdom is better than a big salary. Wisdom is better than money in the bank. In, in Proverbs 7, it says, um, though it costs you all you have, get wisdom. I started reading the book of Proverbs, and where the Lord started really dealing with me was that I needed to really strengthen my character and my integrity. So much. Okay, I'm, I'm fairly like brand new Christian. I'm probably in my, I think it was my second year of being Christian because uh, the first year, half of it I spent in jail. Um, cause, which, hey, it happens, right? Okay, like, I got busted after I got born again, and then I went to court while I was going to church. Now, they were going to put me away for two years. My pastor wrote a letter. Uh, the, uh, uh, the district attorney is like, okay, we gotta, he's got to get at least two years. And the, uh, the judge re- read the letter from my pastor that said I had changed my life, and he knocked it down to six months. And when I tell the story, Jeff, I'll make sure you tell them that you went to work furlough, okay? It, they used to call it Camp Snoopy, okay? It was like, you know, summer camp almost, right? You, I went to jail at night, and I got, I got out to go to work during the day. I mean, it was, it was fine, except that, you know, I slept with, you know, 10 guys in one room. I mean, and um, I snored so bad that they were going to shank me, but... <laughs> So I'm, pray, uh, I'm, I'm praying for wisdom. I'm starting to read the book of Proverbs. The Lord is dealing with me about this subject of integrity. And this, I want to just be clear how the Lord was dealing with me. Like, I want you to stay far away from the line. That's the way the Lord would deal with me. I don't want you to do things the way other people do them. The scripture that comes to mind is in Matthew 7. It says, uh, small is the gate and narrow the road that lead to life and only a few find it. I was so excited about this uh, revelation that the Lord was giving me that I went out and told one of my friends that was way further along uh, than me in business. I said, I want to do it without cheating. I want to do what we're doing and I wanted to give God glory. And this is what he said. I, 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 I thought he would be like, oh, that's a great idea. He's like, there's no way you could make it without cheating. He was wrong. After three or four years, he went out of business. My business had grown like 50 times. He was wrong. I went to my pastor and I was like, before uh, before my business had started growing, I went to my pastor and I'm like, hey, 
God is really dealing with me about my character and integrity, and I believe it's because of my past, and I believe that it has disqualified me for what God has for me. And I just want to tell you this. That does not disqualify you. This is what he said. He said, Mike, this is your past character flaws do not disqualify you. They do not disqualify you for what God has for you. He gave me the verse 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, if anybody be in, if anyone, anyone, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. This is what my pastor spoke in my life. He said, if God is dealing with you, uh, dealing with you about this, it's not that he, it's he's setting you up for something, Mike, for your future. This is not about your past. It's about your present and about your future. Let me give you some of my favorite, favorite Proverbs about integrity. Let me, uh, um, did I, I don't know if I gave the definition. The character definition is a moral, mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Integrity, the definition is it's a strict, uncompromising adherence to a moral code of ethics. And our moral code is the word of God. Okay, it's not, uh, uh, it's not culture's uh, uh, ethics. It's the word of God's ethics. Okay, my favorite, some of my favorite scriptures. Proverbs 13, 6. Righteousness guards the man of integrity. But wickedness overthrows the sinner. Proverbs 21, 3. Clean living before God and justice with your neighbor mean far more to God than religious performance. Proverbs 21, 6, make it to the top by lying and cheating. Get paid back with smoke and a promotion to death. Proverbs 22, 1, it says, I love it in the message. It's great, it's great in the NIV where it says a good name is more desirable than great riches. But in the message, it says a sterling reputation is better than striking it rich. A gracious spirit is better than money in the bank. So I, um, you know, so I'm hearing this, this uh, uh, from the Lord about, uh, about character and about integrity. And, and integrity is literally at the center of character. It's literally right in the middle of it. So I'm, I'm trying to learn and, and I'm reading Proverbs and I'm just trying to get it inside me. And, and I picked up a project and it was, for, I was there, there was an earthquake in uh, 1994, and this guy had bought a bunch of houses he was going to flip, and he needed someone to do some repairs. So I got hired for the first job, and I went out there, and uh, he was a very smart guy, very, very smart guy, and he wanted to open up the living room, and there was a pony wall there with a post that went into the ceiling. And he said to me, he goes, hey, I want to I remove this pony wall, and I want to remove that post to open it up. And I'm all, well, that's great, but um, I'm assuming that that post is structural. He's like, how do you know? I said, who would put a post in the middle of the room if it wasn't structural? He said, well, you need to know for sure. I said, okay, just to know all I need to do, poke my head in the attic. If the post is coming up and it is connected at all to the roof ridge line, then I know for sure it's structural. I poked my head in the attic. I came back and I said, this, uh, the post is structural. He said, I don't care. I want it removed. I said, well, that wouldn't be right. He said, I don't care. Either re I said, I need to hire an engineer and he needs to do it correctly. He said, listen, if you do not remove this wall and this post, then I am going to fire you and get somebody else. And listen, I needed the job. I really needed the job. And so I said, hey, listen, I can't do it. And he said, can't or won't. I said, both. I can't do it and I won't do it. And if you need to, you're going to have to hire somebody else. And then he screamed back at me at the top of his lungs, just do it your way. Prima donna contractor that has to do everything right. 
I, I, I ended up getting several more jobs for him, and um, uh, it went over a year or two-year period. Uh, he called me up on the phone. I went to meet him at, the office, at his office, and he goes, listen, I've just sold my business, and I've now just sold the last house, and I just wanted to call and let you know um, that uh, I'm retiring, and uh, what I have done has been super successful. And I'm like, uh, do I get a bonus? <laughs> He's like, no. But if you ever need a reference, I will be the best reference you ever had. And, um, and I was like, oh, uh, great. And he, and he said one other thing. He said, listen, you did five of the houses, the repairs on five of the houses, and I had other people do the other five. Your five were way more successful. The most successful jobs that were done were the ones that I had worked on. It, it, there will be a favor on your life, church. And when I asked him for a bonus after that one, he still said no. <laughs> but I'll tell you, every time I gave his name as a reference, he, every time somebody called him, I got the job. People started thinking he was related to me. <laughs> a couple years later, he called me on the phone and uh, he had started to date a woman and he was gonna get married. And he, uh, that, uh, uh, the prior week he had went to church with that lady and he had gotten born again. And I was the first person he called. He said, hey, I remember this contractor from a couple years ago that was Christian and a man of integrity. And then when I went to church, it was such a natural thing for me to raise, uh, raise my hand and accept Jesus. You will save both yourself and those that hear you will experience salvation. So um, I'm going to give you uh, a few things that help us to build our character. First is we have to be intentional. It's something that we have to be intentional about. Janet and I, from the time that we first, uh, she recommitted her life and I first got born again, we, met, we were intentional. We said, we are going to do it right. We're going to do it right. We're not going to cheat. Uh, Joshua 24, 15, it says, as, but as for me and my house, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Janet and I made a decision, okay? And I want to tell you, we have not been perfect, but we've really tried to be consistent. And so uh, one thing Janet was, uh, was really strong in uh, is that she said, hey, Mike, um, we have to do it in the little things too, not just the big things. I, I remember one time um, we were shopping and um, we got into the car and we were driving away. And she's, oh, oh no, they gave me change for a 20. And I said, uh, okay. She said, I only gave them a 10. I said, uh, well, it, it will take us like 20 minutes to go back. And she's, oh, we have to go back. And I'm like, can we just mail them a check? <laughs> she's, no, no, this is not a blessing. This is a test. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man that stood uh, when, they stood the, uh, when they've stood the test, because they will receive the crown of life to God as promised to those who love him. So we turn around. We were late to our, uh, wherever we were going. But Janet was insistent that we are always going to operate in integrity, not just with the big stuff, but also with the small stuff. And it's become like a supernatural an attraction. It's like we have a magnet on us to the supernatural of God. People that know me, they're like this, they're all, man, it's like you step in poop and you look at your shoe and go, oh, potpourri. <laughs> we have a magnet for the supernatural of God. In Proverbs, it says, God hates cheating in the marketplace. He loves it when business is above board. And when God loves what you do, even your enemies will have to live at peace with you. Yeah, Janet was talking to, uh, uh, recently. She's all, I know. It's like he steps on a rock. He steps on a rock and he's, oh, I hurt my foot. I stepped on a rock. Oh, it's a diamond. Oh. 
And so um, we're talking about um, areas to build our character. And so um, number two, have accountability. Have accountability. Listen, I don't care who you are. You could, I, you could read your Bible 24 hours a day. You could be like Pastor Jake, okay, that reads his Bible, you know, as much as any person I know, right? Except maybe his dad, okay? <laughs> they are truly Bible monks. It doesn't matter. We still need to have people that we're accountable to. In fact, let me just say this. The further that God grows you, the more accountability you need. Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. 1 Corinthians 15, it says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So, um, you know, I, I started getting actually coached by a business coach. I think it was in about 2005. And the first thing he said to me is, Mike, you have to make sure you build up your accountability with people. And so I met with my staff and, and I told them, I was like, hey, listen, um, we need to hold it, uh, our company to the highest level of integrity. And if you see that I'm not reaching it, I'm giving you permission to speak into my life. And they have. You know, I have two people in my life that don't need permission. One is Janet, okay? She does not need permission to speak into my life, right? I mean, like, uh, when I was a younger Christian, I was on a pretty short leash, okay? And it has a choker chain on it. <laughs> right now, she's given me a, long, a little bit of a longer leash, but I know that she could yank that thing at any time. And I, I know it sounds silly and funny, but I need it. I need it because, listen, okay, you know the scripture where it says, um, how do you look um, at the sliver in your brother's eye and, uh, and don't see the two by four in your own eye? That scripture is typically taught to about uh, judging others, but there's another deeper principle inside it, and it's this, I cannot see inside of my own eyes. I need people around me that can see into my eyes that, that, I, that love me and I've given them permission to speak into my life. Listen, this is what, this is what stops catastrophes. When I was up this morning and I was praying for you, I was like, Lord, may they receive this and may every catastrophe be averted. Um. When I, when I was a younger Christian, there was this guy that had so impacted my life, and like he was the one that taught me how to pray in the Spirit. He was the one that taught me how to uh, 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 worship, uh, uh, worship God, uh, and he just really had influence and impacted me. It was like a traveling guy, that, a traveling minister guy, and, and, and the guy had, he like had a significant crash and burn. I mean, he crashed. He crashed and burned. I went to the, and let me just say this, it happens in every arena of life. Okay, doctors crash, businessmen crash. We've seen it in the music and movie industry, people crash. People also crash in the, in the church arena, right? It happens. It's not, it's not, character deficiency is not limited to one arena of life. So uh, after this guy had crashed, I was like, man, if he can't make it, who can? And, and, I, and, and the Lord really spoke to me and said, he was not accountable to people. So it doesn't matter who you are. We have to be accountable. It will save your life. You know, I, I met with our CPA and I just said, hey, listen, I'm traveling around the country and I teach on character and integrity. I cannot come even close to the line. You know what my, uh, uh, my CPA said to me? He said, listen, I have 300 people, 300 businesses that I represent. You're the only one that's ever said that. And the reason why is it that I'm trying to do something that's you know, different. It's I'm trying to protect our life. I'm trying to protect our witness for who Jesus is. Okay, we're talking about building our character. Colossians 3.15, it says, um, and I'm just going to use this one part. In the Amplified, it says, let the Holy Spirit be the umpire of your life. I mean, I've gotten really good at black and white, 
okay? But the truth of the matter is, we live in the gray, and there's existential circumstances, and we have to be able to push into the Holy, lean into the Holy Spirit, which one of its names is the counselor. And when we lean into the Holy Spirit, when we lean into the Holy Spirit, he will show us stuff that we wouldn't have known. Helps us make decisions that can avoid catastrophe. Look at the one guy that, that missed $2,000 worth of waterproofing, and it cost him 50000 times 150. The, let the Holy Spirit be the umpire of your life. And so um, I had gotten, uh, uh, I shared a couple weeks ago that I had, um, I had had a breakthrough job where it was so much bigger than any job that I'd ever done before. And um, I really wanted to serve my clients. I really wanted to serve them. And so I had heard this message on serving and I really wanted to serve my customers. And so I met with them, and I was asking them what they were trying to accomplish. And, they, and they, they told me that, hey, listen, most contractors don't really care what we're trying to accomplish. They only care about what they can get from us. And I told them, I said, I want to help you. The uh, definition for serve is to help, to assist, to aid, to add value, to equip. It's, it comes from the same root word in the Greek as the word minister comes from. What is it that we do here? We serve. What is this called? It used to be called a service. Now we call it an experience. But this is a place where people can be ministered to. Value is added to you. So I met with my client and, uh, you know, and I was telling them, you know, like I wanted to help them. And they, t they had a moment where they said, hey, we have to get this building done in six months or we might get fired. You know, I, I went back to my foreman and I'm like, hey, how long is it going to take us to do this job? And he said, it's one week per building. And there, there was 38 buildings. So um, that's 38 weeks. And I said, no, we have to get it done faster. I promised the owners that we would get it done in six months. And they're like, Mike, there's no way possible. It's not possible. There, each building takes one week. You have uh, work to do, then you have inspection, and then you have dry time, and then you have inspection. It's going to take one week per building. I said, we have to get it done faster. They said, Mike, there's no way. The only way is if we hire a second crew. I'm like, let's do it. We had like 12 guys. It took eight guys to do the, uh, the work of, on one building. We hired four more guys. We kind of switched them up. And I found a little, uh, a little loophole where I could actually start the job a week earlier. And we got out there and we started and we figured out how to do it. And I didn't deliver it to them in six months. I delivered it to them in 19 weeks. I was like their hero. One of the guys that was, uh, first of all, they gave me every job they had for seven years. Uh, one of the guys um, started his own business and he needed a con uh, someone to do the construction and he took me as his partner. The contractor with his dog in the back of the truck becomes the partner of the guy that was an assistant to a billionaire. Uh, the other, the other, uh, uh, the other manager became uh, like a senior manager, and then a junior vice president, and then a vice president, then a senior vice president of a multi-billion-dollar company. He came and heard me speak and raised his hand and made Jesus Lord of his life. Serving is the key to greatness. Serving is the key to leadership. Jesus did not come to be served. Jesus came to serve. And it builds our character. It builds our character. And so um, that, uh, that went on for like seven years. Like, and, and I was like, was, I was just, you know, I didn't know anything. I have no education. Super, like I had like seven years of like super God dependency, right? And I'm like, like victory after victory. And then um, and then I had a crash. And so this is where it becomes dangerous. See, um, integrity is at the heart of character. 
Service builds integrity. But humility is what gives it a supernatural power and authority. So I had like seven years, success, victory after victory, and then all of a sudden, I crashed. I crashed. I had one job that lost money. I went back to the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, how did I lose money? And I felt like the Lord said, you stopped asking me what jobs to take and what jobs not to take. I started thinking I was smart. When you think you're smart, you're really dumb. Don't ever walk into a room and think that you're the smartest person in the room. Because if you think you're the smartest person in the room, then what you do is you disqualify yourself from being able to learn from other people. Jan and I were talking just last night like, hey, we, you know, if we thought every time we heard a message preach, oh, I heard that before. It disqualifies us from being able to learn. What if we thought, hey, I read the Bible. How come I have to listen to it again? It disqualifies us. I, I, you know, I, uh, uh, true story, I was meeting with one of the guys that I work with, and he's like, hey, you know, uh, I hear, uh, I heard that uh, when you're the smartest guy in the room, that, um, that maybe you're in the wrong room. And I'm like, first of all, bro, it's just me and you in the room. <laughs> so I don't know what you're trying to say. And maybe you are smarter than me. I don't really think so, but maybe you are. But you are not smarter than my senior vice president, Dave Holland, okay? He's like a genius. You're not smarter than Erica Lopez. I guarantee it, okay? And so uh, it's just, when people think, when we think we're smart, we're really stupid. Do not be wise in your own eyes. I forgot that. And I, I ended up getting in a big argument with their, one of their construction managers of the company that had given me jobs for seven years, right? And I, I got angry. And, you know, like, he's like, hey, Mike, you've changed. I had. And I got humbled. See, like, if you do not humble yourself, you will be humbled. Yeah. And it was pretty humbling to have to stand up in front of my staff and say, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I lost my temper and we lost the contract. It was very humbling. I, um, I prefer not to do that. <laughs> if you do not humble yourself, you will be humbled. I was going to write a message called the five biggest mistakes that I've made. But the problem was I got to five and I'm like, there's so many more. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing is every mistake Every major mistake that I, I've made has been directly related to pride. Every single one of them. Okay, you know, um, Janet's not here because I, I don't want because she'll take too many too much props for this. Is like every time that Janet and I have not been in uh, unity and I've moved forward, it ended up being a bad mistake. I have learned now that I, listen, I will not step forward and do something unless Janet and I are in unity. I don't care. I don't care what anybody else says. If Janet and I are not, because that's where God commands a blessing. There is no benefit for me to do anything that I'm not in unity with my wife about. I, we, have a little, we have a little rhythm that we do. I come to her. She asks me if I prayed about it. If I hadn't prayed about it, I go back and pray about it. Sometimes I'll go to her. she say, hey, I want you to pray about it a second time. It's either green, yellow, or red with her, Right? And, and so even when it's green, I have to go back and pray about it and make sure and filter through the Holy Spirit. Humility, which it comes from the Greek word praus, which means um, power under perfect control. And let me just say this. Jesus is uh, the epitome of humility. Philippians 2 Three through nine, I'm going to read it fast. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, interest, but each of you to the interests of others. 
in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every other name. And the name that, uh, that every, at every tongue shall, and shall bow. Proverbs 3.10, where there is strife, there is pride. You know, um, becoming or being a peacemaker as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone you know i um one of the guys that i work with uh we have, we've worked we've known each other since we were in junior high school and um uh he came and we were talking and he told me hey i'm going to I'm gonna get divorced. My wife and I are gonna get divorced. And um, I really felt strongly that they would get back together. So I spoke it out of my mouth. And, and you have, you just, church, you have the benefit that you have Jesus on the inside of you and you can speak life into people. And so I, I was like, every time I saw him, I was like, John, you and Angie are gonna get back together. He's like, no, we're divorced. He's, and, then he, and then I'd say it again, and he's like, she's dating somebody else. And then, he'd, and then he'd say, he was dating somebody else. And I'd say, I don't care. You need to break up with that other girl because you and Angie are getting back together. And so uh, uh, after a few years, um, one Saturday, he called me on the phone and we met at my office. Um, and this is a rough construction guy, okay, rough. We sit down next to each other on a Saturday and he goes like this to me, he goes, hey Mike, will you pray with me? I wanna accept Jesus. I almost fell out of my seat, okay? I never expected it, you know? God could do things in people that you never expected. I prayed the prayer with him and, and he raised his hand and he accepted Jesus and right when I was done, he goes, Mike, Angie and I, we got back together which is cool, it's, um, uh, which, was, which was amazing, right? And, but it almost didn't happen. Him getting born again almost didn't happen. It would not have been hap- it would not have happened. So what, what did happen was uh, we were uh, working on a job and him and I had a conflict and a dispute. And he wanted to let an employee go. And um, uh, one of the challenges of uh, uh, being a pastor and a businessman is, um, is I sometimes give people a few more chances. Um, and so um, I'm getting better at understanding that if I release them, they could go uh, work where God's calling them to work. And so he wanted to let this guy go. I didn't want to let him go. We got in an argument and he's like, hey, if you don't respect my uh, judgment, then maybe I should quit. And I'm like, hey, listen, if you don't respect my authority, maybe I should fire you. He's all, you know what? I quit. And I said, you can't quit. And he's all, why not? I said, because I already fired you. <laughs> don't let authority go to your head. You know, I went and talked to my, uh, my senior vice president and he's like, Mike, you know what? You can do what you want, but I'm telling you, you're making a mistake. I went back to my office and I, I like, you know, sat at my desk and, um, and I had a sudden surge of unexpected intelligence <laughs> as I cried out to God, like, God, what should I do? And I really felt like the Holy Spirit said, make it right. There might be somebody in your life you need to make it right with. And it just gives so much power and so much authority to your witness of who Jesus is. I called John on the phone and I said, John, 
I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, I, I, you know, and, and I, I, don't wanna, I don't want you to quit, and I don't want to fire you. And he was like, Mike, I never wanted to quit, and I never, uh, um, I never wanted to stop working with you. And so um, I'm so glad that happened. <laughs> I'm so glad because, you know, a year later he got born again. How many people out there are just on the other side? How many souls are of us just humbling ourselves? How many? Church, I, you, you know, like, you might have something in your life. Like, you know, there's been some times, and I will say, more than, more, more than occasionally, where I've struggled with pride. And um, with, um, with every eye closed, I wanna just ask you, is there some area of your life that you're struggling with? And um, I was praying for you this morning and the scripture came up, can you put it up for me? It's 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. And it's such, in the NIV, it's such a beautiful scripture. If possible, I can quote it if not. In a large house, there are items of gold and silver and of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some are for ignoble purposes. If a man will cleanse himself from the latter, he will become useful for the master for every good work. There might be something in your life, and, I, and I, I'm just gonna say there's something in every single one of our lives that we need to cleanse ourselves from so that we can be useful for the master for every good work. So Lord, I just lift up the people of the city church. I lift them up to you, God. I thank you, God, as, uh, uh, and I just ask you, search our hearts, oh God. God, search our hearts and point out anything that's detestable to you, Lord. And show us, Lord, and send us on the way everlasting. Lord, I thank you, God, that, uh, that we are aware. We are aware of a spirit of pride, and I bind that very spirit of pride right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that we have a spirit of humility that can only be accessed by spending time and, and, uh, and our connection to you, Jesus who are you who you are the the clear example of humility thank you god we just thank you god and i just thank you god uh, that my prayer this morning for you uh, uh, for our churches that we would be known as uh, the church with the highest character of any church anywhere i just declare that over over the uh, over your lives i declare it we are people of high character we love God more than most men love God, and we are people of integrity.